put my first batch in. Let me play a tune while we wait for them to bake or uh, not bake, cook. They're cooking. Probably shouldn't start with that one. I think I have enough for one more song. Just checking my oven.
Hamlin towns in Brunswick, my famous Hanover city. The river west are deep and wide, washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter spot you've never spied. But when begins my ditty, almost 500 years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles, and made the cheeses from the vats and licked the soup from the cook's own ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nest in men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last the people in a body to the town hall came to walking. Tis clear, cried they, our mayor is a naughty, and as for our corporation, shocking. To think we buy gowns lined with ermine, for dolts who can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you're old and obese to find in the furry civic robes ease. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking, to find the remedy we are lacking, for sure as fate will send you packing. At this, the mayor corporation quaked with the mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council, at length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder, I'd my ermine down south. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my poor head aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just he said this, what should happen? At the chamber door, but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation as he sat, looking little too wondrous fat. Grew brighter were his eyes with moisture, and a too long open oyster. Save when I knew his paunch grew mutinous, for a plate of turtle green and goodness. Only a scraping of shoes on a back. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His long queer coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, and light loose hair and swarthy skin, nor tuft of hair on cheek nor beard on chin. But lips with smile went out and in, there was no guessing his kith or kin, and no, nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, which as my great grandsire, starting up at the trunk of Doom's tone, had walked this way from his painted tombstone. He bent towards the council table. Please, Your Honor, said he, I am able, by means of seek a charm to draw, all other creatures living beneath the sun, the crawlers, swim or fly around, after me, so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm, on creatures that do people harm, the mole and toad and newt and viper, and people call me the Pied Piper. Here they noticed round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe to match with his coat of self-same check. That scarf's end hung a pipe, and his fingers they noticed were ever straying, as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe, as low it dangled over his vesture so old fangled. <clears throat> yes, said he, pied piper as I am, in Tartaria I fred the cam, last June from his huge swarms of gnats. I ease in Asia the Nizam, of a monster's brood of vampire bats, and as for what your brain bewilders, if I read your town of rats, will you give me one thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand was the exclamation of an astonished mayor and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Like a musical adept to blow his pipe, his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, he heard as if an army muttered. The muttering grew to a grumbling, and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling. Great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old plotters, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, talking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the pipe paper for their lives, the sweet sweet pipe advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Wesser, wherein all plunged and perished, save one who stoned Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he's a manuscript to cherish, to Ratland Homer's commentary, which was, after the shrill notes on the pipe, I heard a sound of the scraping trite, pointing out was wondrous right, into the side of this train, and moving away to the cupboard, leaving a jar of monster cover, and drawing the corks of train all glass, a great name of butter cast, it seemed as if the voice sweeter far than my heart or my soul Called out bold rats rejoice. The world is growing to a vast and sultry. Some lunch on, crunch on, take the nunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just a bulky sugar punch on, already stayed like a great sun shone. Gracious, scarce, and ate before me, just as we thought it said, come for me. I found the west rolling over me. 
you should have heard from how many people ring the bells and they rock the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, and get long poles. Go to the nest and block the poles. Consult with carpenters and builders, and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats. Went suddenly up the face of the pipe of perk in the marketplace. The first, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders? The mayor looked blue. So did the corporation, too. For Council of Dennis made her havoc with Torre and Moselle, bringing the draw of Hoff. And half the money would replenish, their salary pigs but a brennish, to pay this sum to a wondering fellow, with gypsy coat of red and yellow. Besides, quoth American knowing wink, our business are done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink. Wood dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink, and a matter of money to put in your poke. But as for the gilders, what we spoke of them, as you all know, was a joke. Besides, our losses made us thrifty. A thousand gilders, come, take fifty. The piper's face fell, and he cried, No trifling, I can't wait beside. I promise a visit by dinner time, Baghdad, and accept the prime of the head cook's potage, all he is rich in, for having left in Michaela's kitchen, of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him I prove no bargain driver, but you don't think I'll bait a stiver. The folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe after another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I broke, being restricted then a cook, insulted by a rival, with idle pipe and vesture piebald? Threaten us, fellow, do your worst, blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe as smooth straight cane. And ere he blew three notes, such sweet soft notes as yet musicians cunning never gave the enraptured air. There's a rustling that seemed like a bustling, and Mary Cow's jostling and pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping, and little tongues chattering. Like foals in the farm, like a barley is scattering, out came the children running. All the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flats and curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls. Tripping and skipping around merrily after, the wonderful music was shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood, as if they're changed in the blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry, to the children merrily skipping by. Could only follow with an eye that joyous crowd at the piper's back, and how the mayor was on the rack, and the wretched council's bosom's beat, as the piper turned from the high street, to where the west had rolled its waters, right in the way of their sons and daughters. However, he turned from south to west, to Copperberg Hill his steps address, and after him the children pressed. Great was the joy in every breast. He never crossed the mighty top. He's forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When lo, they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollow. The piper advanced, and the children followed. When all were in the very last, the door of the mountainside shut fast. Did I say all? Oh, no one was lame. Do not dance a whole of the way. And then after years, if you blame his sadness, he used to say, as dull in our town since my playmates left, I can't forget that I'm bereft of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me. For he left, le, for he let us, for he let us, he said, to enjoy his land, joining, joining, uh, ah, ma. The mayor was done, and the council stood, as if they changed the blocks, but unable to move a step or cry, to the children merrily skipping by, could only follow with an eye that joyous crowd of the piper's back. Now the mayor is on the rack, and the wretched council was as the piper was turned, turned from the high street, where the western rolled its waters, right in the way of their sons and daughters. However, he turned from southwest to Copper Hill with steps to dress, and after the hymn the children pressed, great was the joy in every He never crossed the mighty top, he's forced to let the piping drop, and we so see our children stop. When lo, they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollow. The piper advanced, and the children followed. When all were into the very last, the door in the mountainside shut back. Did I say all? No one was lame. You cannot dance a whole of the way. And then after years, if you blame the sadness, you used to say, this doll in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget that I'm bereft. Of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me, for he led us, he said, to a joyous land, joining the town in jest at hand, where the waters gushed and fruit trees grew, the flowers were forth a fairer hue, and everything was strange and new. The sparrows brightened up peacock here, their dogs are round our fellow deer, and honeybees had lost their sting, and the horses were born with eagles' wings. Just as I became assured, my lame folk was speedily cured. The music stopped, and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, left behind against my will, to go now let me as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas for Hamelin, there came into many a burger's pain, a text which says at heaven's gate, hopes the rich at its easy rate, as an eagle's eye takes a camel in. The mayor said to east, west, north, and south, to offer the piper by word of mouth, Wherever it was man's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content, if only to return the way he went, bring the children behind him. But when they saw it was lost endeavor, the piper and dancers were gone forever. They made a decree that lawyers never 
to the director, to David Dooley, to come to the day of the month and year, and these words are not inspired here. And so long after what happened here on the 22nd of July, 1376, they better memory fix the place of the children's last retreat. They call it Pied Piper Street, where anyone playing Piper Street was sure for his future to lose his labor, nor suffered they hostel or tavern, chalked with worth the street so solemn, and opposite the place of the cavern, there was a story on a column, and on great church window painted, the same to make the world acquainted how their children were stolen away, and there it stands this very day. And must not admit to say that Transylvania there is a tribe of alien people who ascribe the way of dress in which their neighbors lay such stress to their fathers and mothers having risen out of some subterranean prison into which they were to pan a long time ago in a mighty band out of Hamlin towns and Brunswick land, but how or why they don't understand. So, Lily, let me and you be wipers of scores out with all men, especially pipers. And if they should pipe us free from rats or from mice, if we promise them aught, let us keep our promise. Oh, I'm making bagels. If you're still watching, sorry. Uh, I'm making bagels and reciting poetry. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the reciting poetry was pretty obvious. But uh, I guess it's not so obvious that I'm making bagels. I, I recite poetry in the morning to get my, my brain energized, get it revved up, get the RPMs going. Brain RPMs. This is uh, this is one of our last uh, streaming sessions from this location. This location is going to be torn down because they're going to build a a sky train or uh, a transit platform, a, a transit station. Going to rip all these buildings out. I love this location. It's gonna be a sad day when it's gone. I love this this oven. It's my favorite oven in the whole wide world. They're gonna eviscerate it, dismantle and eviscerate it. It's a sad day in the history of bagels. Played, guess that tune. What tune was that? Audience. 
or I should say chat, audience. Chat, what song is that? You could win a dozen bagels if you guess the name of that song. If you come down here, if you, if you, if you, if you can guess the name of that song, you can come down here and get bagels off of me personally. Play the game. Play the game, chat. I know there's only one of you there. You have an advantage because you have no competition. You don't know that song. Well, let, let me try to figure it out. Um, You should know that song. Come on, chat. Come on, chat. Come on. Come on, come on. I'll give you a clue. It was written by four British young lads from Liverpool about a young man His name may, may or may not be rhyme, may or may not rhyme with rude. Chad, you're not playing the game. I'll give it to you again.
There once was a young man named Roland Pye who played the recorder when he wasn't baking bagels. One day he was walking through a park and playing his recorder to rest a while from all his baking when suddenly he spied a corpse lying on the ground beneath his form of flies. He put down his recorder, walked over to the corpse, shooed the flies away, covered with that band of stones. Returning to his oven later that day, he found that his oven blade had gone on by itself and already baked half the bagels he needed. From that day on, Roland Pied was the happiest baker alive. He'd bake until he was tired, then he'd pull his recorder out of his pocket while his oven blade went on by itself. But Roland Pied lived in a town whose mayor did not admire his skill and was jealous of his fame. So the mayor devised a plan to rid the town of Roland. In the beginning, he said that Roland was a good worker but lazy. Next, he said that Roland baked a whole lot, but badly. Then he accused Roland of being a sorcerer. The people turned on him. Therefore, Roland Pied took his recorder and left his home behind. When Roland Pied came to a neighboring town, he went to all the business owners, but none of them would give him any work. Finally, he met an old buster, and that's the work he body and mind together. Come along with me, said the old man, and we will share all of this. So Roland Pied and the old man started going around and singing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how do you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman thoughts are well. All gold is gold and good for hell. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to cream. Your limbs are the knots of cords, an old-fashioned machine. Baker, mine brings and mass forms. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are who you are. Not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Everybody gave alms the old man. But to Roland, they said, What is a young man like you out begging? Why don't you work for a living? Nobody will hire me, replied Roland Pied. That's what you say. There's a king with so many hungry soldiers that he'll pay good wages for anyone to, for anyone to feed them. So Roland Pied went to the king's kitchen and took the old man whose alms had been cheering. The oven had never been used by anyone. Roland mixed the dough. Then he rolled it into rings. Then he boiled them, dressed them in seeds, baked them until they're golden brown. Then he tossed them into a crate to cool down. Whenever Roland wearied of baking, he'd play his recorder. Once he was weary of playing his recorder, he would sing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves you. Well, all the wood is gold and good for her hell. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to clean. Your limbs are the knots of cords, an old fashioned machine. Baker, mine rings and bash the boards. You don't need their plot for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are. Not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Hearing the singing, a princess looked out the window. She saw Roland Pied and fell in love with him. But she was a princess, so he a baker. The king would never consent to their marriage. So they decided to run away together. They fled at night and boat. They were already on the high seas when Roland remembered the busker. He said to his beloved, We must fetch the old man, since he shared his alms with me. We can't go off and leave him like that. At that very moment, the old man came up behind the boat, walking on the water as though it was dry land. Reaching the boat, he said, We agree to divide everything we had, and I shared everything I owe. Now you have the king's daughter. You must give half of her to me. At this, he gave Roland Pye a knife to cut his bride to. Roland Pye took the knife with a trembling hand. You are right, he said. You are perfectly right. He was on the point of cutting his bride in two, when suddenly the old man stopped him. Stop! I knew you were a just man. I am the dead man, mind you, whom you covered with stones. Go now, and may the two of you always be happy. At this, the old man walked away on the waves. The boat came to an island rich in all good things, with the princely palace awaiting the newlyweds. Okay, time for guess that song again. Uh, let's see. Uh,
don't know the next song. I, I don't think you're a patriot. I'm making bagels. Blaze Benny number five. The switch off of it. Uh, what if they have night goggles on? Hmm? I don't think I don't think he's all of all the contingencies here. Oh, thanks. So it's not my place personally. I don't live here or anything. It's uh, it's a bakery in Vancouver, British Columbia. This uh, this this actually this location is going to be demolished. In, uh, in, in uh, by the end of June, June I think it's going to be. I don't know. I'm not sure if they're going to demolish it or what's happening to it. But uh, we're shutting down because uh, the city's taking over this property. Or, or the city, I think the city might already own this property. And they're, they're gonna build a, a, a transit station here. Even though, I, I don't know if anybody's gonna be using transit anymore now that coronavirus is uh, a thing. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. I think they should cancel the transit. And, and uh, Keep the bakery open. That's my opinion. Yeah, I'm here all by myself right now. We open at uh, we open at eight o'clock. We have altered our schedule is altered. We usually open at seven, but uh, uh, we, we uh, we're on an altered schedule for now. I think I'm not sure if it's changing soon, but it might. But I start at I start my shift at four. Yeah, no, I, I don't know if uh, I don't know how I, my coworkers would deal with m all my poetry rants, my poetic rantings. It's a good thing I'm alone. Probably would have got fired a long time ago. Ha 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 ha. Da 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 da. Oh, keep the energy up. It's gonna be a long day today. Very long day.
dying for a coffee. Literally dying for a coffee. First batch is almost done. Light it is done. Maybe I'll, I'll get up and kind of flip here and let it bake a little bit on the other side just to make sure it's all good. It's all golden. Goldy brown. Oh, those are beautiful. Hello. Let's play another. Uh, let's play another round of uh, guess that song. Uh, let's see. What's another song? Uh, da, da, da. Here, I'll give you an easy one. This is this is a this is a softball toss song. Uh, Maybe that's not an easy one. That's green sleeves. Uh, See, so yeah, it's an easy one because you guys haven't gotten any of the other ones yet. You should be able to get that one. Here's another easy one.
My first thought was he lied in every word. That hoary cripple with malicious eye asking us to watch the working of his lie on mine, and most scarce able to afford suppression of the glee the person who scored a dead jack one more victim gained thereby. What else should he be set for with his staff? What save the wailing of his lies is there? All travelers might find a post there, and ask the road. My guest would skull like laugh would break, would crutch and write my epitaph and pass on the dusty thoroughfare. If at his counsel I should turn aside into ominous track which all agree hides in our town, acquiescing that he turned as he pointed, neither pride to hope the kindling at the end described, so much as gladness the men might be. For what with my whole world wide wondering, what with my search drawn out for years, my hope dwindled into a ghost not fit to cope with that obstreperous joy success would bring. I hardly tried now to rebuke the spring, my heart made finding failure in its scope. As a sick man very near to death seems dead indeed, and feels begin and end the tears, and takes a farewell of each friend, and hears one bid the other go, draw breath freelier outside, since all is over, he saith, and the blow fallen, no grieving can amend. While some discuss if near other graves be room enough for this, or when a day suits best for carrying the corpse away, with care about banners, scarfs, and staves, and still the man hears all and only craves, he may not shame such tender love and stay. Thus I had for so long suffered in this quest, heard failure prophesied so oft being writ, so many times among the band of wit, the knights who two dark towers search address their steps, that just to fail as they seemed best, and all doubt was now should I be fit. So quiet as despair I turned from him, that hateful cripple, out of his highway into the path he pointed. All the day had been a dreary one at best, and dim was settling into its close, yet shot one grim red leer to see the blade play and catch it the stray. For Mark, no sooner was I fairly found, pledged the plane after a pace or two, then pause and throw back at the last view. Over the safe road t'was gone, grey plain all round, nothing but plain the horizons bound. I must go on, not else for me to do. So on I went. I think I never saw such starved and noble nature. Nothing throws, the flowers as well expect to see go, but chortle and spurge according to their law. Might propagate their kind to none to all, and think a bird be the treasure trove. No penny in the singer made in some strange soul word lands portion. See or close your eyes, said he, strategically. In nothing skill, can't help my case. Tis last of judgment's fire must cure this place. Tell time is flawed and death by kicking the tree. If they're pushing me back with this to stop above its mates and tear the shop, to bends her jealous cells, will made the holes and rents in the dock's harsh force leaves. Bruises to walk, all of open trees. Tis a boot must walk, passion their life over bruise and tents. As for the grass, it grew as scarce as hair and leprosy, thin dry blades to prick the blood, which underneath was kneaded up with blood. One stiff blind horse as every bone was there, stood stupefied, however, and came there, thrust up past servants from the devil's gut. Alive, he might be dead for aught I know, with bread, corn, and color, and strain, and shed eyes beneath the rusty mane. Seldom went such grotesques with such woe. I never saw a brute that hated so. He must have been wicked to deserve such pain. I shut my eyes and turned them on my heart. As the man called to wine before he fights, I asked one draft of earlier and happier sights. For fitly I can hope to play the part. Think first, fight afterward, and sold the dark. One taste of old times sets all over the rights. Not if I fancy the captor's rending face beneath its carnature of curly gold. Dear fellow, so I almost felt him fold. An arm in mine to fix me to that place. That way he used at last with night disgrace. Oh, and my heart's on fire and left me cold. Giles, then, the soul of honor, and there he stands. Frank is ten years ago at night at first, and on his mansion there he said he durst good, but the scene she had fought with hangman's hand pinned to his breast of parchment, his own abandoned and poor traitor spit upon cursed. Good of this present in the past like that, back therefore to my darkened path, the sound of sight as far as the eye could strain, with well, a night said a howl at her a bad I asked, and something on the dismal flat came to arrest my thoughts and change the train. A silly little river across my path, as unexpected as a serpent came, no tides congenial to the glooms. This is a froth by, might have been a bath for the fiends going up, to see the wrath of the black head spat with flakes and spoons. So petty and so spiteful all along, low scrubby alders milled over it, drenched willows flowing in headlong in a faint throat despair, a suicidal throng, the river which had done them all the wrong, whatever that was rolled by to turn no whit. Which while I quoted, good saints, how I feared to set my foot upon a dead man's cheek, he'd step a feeling spear at thrust to seek, for hollows tangled in his hair and beard, and they'd be in a water rat spear, but I'll get sounded like a baby shriek. 
Glad was I to reach other bank, now for a better country. Vain presage, who are the strugglers? What war do they wage? Whose savage trunk does pad the dank soil to a clash? Toads in a poison tank, the wild cats in the red hawk cage. The fight must so have seen in not foul, sir. What penman there with all the plain to choose? No footsteps leading to that border views. None out of it, mad crews set to work their brains, no doubt my galley saves turf, and scores past us. More than that, for a long on, why there? What bad use was that engine for? That wheel, or brake not wheel, that harrow fit to reel, men's bodies out like soap. With all the air of tongs, tool on earth left unaware, or brought to sharpen its rusty teeth with steel. Then came some stub ground, once wood, next to Martian sea. Now mere earth, desperate and done with, so the fool finds mirth, makes a thing and mars it, till his mood changes and off he goes. Within a rude bog, clay and marsh, sand and stark black dirt. Now watch his wrangling colored game grim, now patches where some leanness of the soil's broken moss or substances like wood. Then came a palsy to cracked in him, distorted belt and splits its rim, gaping at death and dies while he coils. As far as ever from the end, not in the distance, but the evening not, point my footsteps further at the thought. Great black bird appalling his bosom strength, sail past the roof's wide winged drag pen, the brush my cap, which hence the eye I saw. But looking up at where I set my roof, Trying to get place around the mountains with such names to grace me heights and heaps now stolen in view. How this to surprise me solve you? How to get from there was no clear case. Yet half I should seem to recognize some trick of mischief had happened to me. God knows when, in a bad dream perhaps, here ended then progress's way. When in the very nick of giving up one more time came a click as when the trap shuts are in the den. Burningly it came upon me all at once, this was the place, those two hills crouched like two bulls, locked horn and horn in fight, while to left a tall scout mountain, guns, daughter, dozing, and the very nuns, after a lifetime trained for the sight. Not see. What in midst lay but the tower itself, the round squat turret, blind as a fool's heart, built of brown stone without a counterpart in the whole world. The tempest clock points the ship and thus the unseen ship. It strikes up only when timbers start. Not see. When noise would not see because of night crap, why day came back for that. Behind left the dark sunset, kindled through a cleft. The hills like two giants in a hunting lay, chin upon hand to see the game that day. Now skip the stab and end the creature to the haft. Not here, when noise was everywhere, it told, increasing like a bell, names in my ear, a lost adventurers, my peers, how such was long, how how such was strong and such was bold and such was fortunate and each of old lost lots one moment now bold and here. There they stood, ranged along the hillside met, to view the last of me, a living frame for one more picture to sheet of flame. I saw them and knew them all, and yet, dauntless the slug more to my lips I set, a blue child rolling to a dark tower cave.
think I'm alone now. Do 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 do. I think I'm alone now. Da 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 Excuse me. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which connect them to another, and assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires the nation to declare the causes which impel them to separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the universe with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments instituted men deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. And experience accordingly has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer when evils are sufferable than right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they have become accustomed. Well, one long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, brings the design to use them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient's sufferance of these colonies, and such the necessity which constrains them to alter their formation of government. The history of the present, Engl present King of England is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, that facts be submitted to a candid world. These refuse assent to laws most wholesome and necessary for the public good. First thing I found was a flower book in the sky. 
Da 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 da
Wake up, chat. Wake up. Wake. Fuck up. Once was a rich man who had just one son, and the boy was dearly loved by his father. As everybody knows, the greatest courage on earth for a rich man is work. Therefore, when his son turned 14, the father decided to send him to school to learn the science of laziness. On the same street as the rich man, there lived a famous and highly respected professor who had never done a lick of work in his life he could get out of doing. The rich man called on him, and 
found him stretched out in the garden under a fig tree with a cushion under his head, a cushion under his back, and a cushion under his buttocks. Before talking to him, I must first see how he does, said the rich man to himself, and he hid behind a hedge to observe the man. The professor lay as still as a corpse with his eyes closed. The only time he stirred was whenever he heard the thud of a ripe fig falling on the ground near where he lay. He reached slowly out, bring the fruit to his mouth, and swallow it. Then he wouldn't stir again until another fig fell. This is just a professor my son needs, decided the rich man. And he came out from his hiding place, introduced himself, and asked the professor to teach his son the science of laziness. Old man answered the professor just above a whisper, Don't talk so much. It tires me to listen to you. If you want to bring your son up as you and I are, just send him to me. So the rich man went home, took his son by the hand, thrust a feathered pillow under his arm, and led him to the garden. I urge you, he told him, to do everything you see this professor of idleness do. The boy, who already had an inclination for that particular science, also stretched out under the fig tree. Observing his teacher, he saw him reach for every fig that fell and bring it to his mouth. Why should I work myself to death reaching for figs, he thought, and he lay there with his mouth wide open. Soon a fig fell into his mouth, and he let it go down slowly. Then he reopened his mouth. Another fig fell. This time he missed. He lay there perfectly still and murmured, Why so wide the mark? Fig fall into my mouth. Seeing how wise his pupil already was, the professor said, Go on now. You have nothing to learn from me. You can even teach me something. So the boy went home to his father, who thanked heaven for having given him such a smart son. The end.
that's all she bagel today uh, thanks for watching I gotta go get a coffee Farewell, adieu, adieu, a Wiedersehen, war of war, ciao.